<laughs> and uh, Father, we want to just thank you for the journey of this man of God. We want to thank you, Lord, for the investment that you've invested into him over the years and his faithfulness, Lord, uh, to, to, as a faithful steward, to work the talents that he's got, that he's not just a man that talks the talk, he walks the walk, and he will speak to us today out of a journey, out of experience. And Lord, we do ask for increase of the manifestation of the spirit of revelation and counsel to flow in him and through him this morning in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. 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 Well, I do. Amen. So you've got that, so just make sure it works. Okay, is it working? That's working. It's working. Thank you. just want to thank uh, Glenn for inviting me, his wife, and uh, for you as the church for having me this morning. I just want to introduce my wife at the back there. That's uh, Lee Lorraine Beardall. And uh, some of my friends here today, you want to give us a wave to some of my friends who've come? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I married Lee in 1980. I'm now 73. And she was just a young 20-year-old when I met her, 21-year-old. I was about 30. And I stood on a bridge in England, YWAM. I was in YWAM for 15 years, up until 19, uh, 1988. I stood on this bridge and I said, <clears throat> I proclaimed. I didn't really understand proclaiming in those days, by the way. But I just made this proclamation. It was like the Spirit of God came upon me. And I prophetically said, I release my wife from the north, south, east, and west, and from the uttermost parts of the earth. And guess where New Zealand is compared to where England is? It's the uttermost parts of the earth. So how did she get to me? God providentially, providentially is God's supernatural intervention into her life, into my life, right? I felt like, uh, you know, from age, up to age 26, I wanted to get married. 25, I wanted to get married. Join y one. I was not interested in women at all for the first five years, to be quite honest. Just wanted to go for God. I was doing a poll, you know. Didn't want some woman stuffing up my life. And, uh, <laughs> because they had. <laughs> Let me tell you. And uh, anyway, <clears throat> with Lee, she was in a church called Teatasu Baptist in, New, in uh, New Zealand, Auckland. And I discipled a young fellow called Steve Sullivan. He went back for a sabbatical. He bumped into Lee and she bumped, she Lord came up to uh, Steve and said, Hey, I'm going to YWAM. I'm going to Switzerland, she said. And he said prophetically to her, No, you're not. You're going to go to England. It's the best school. Go to England. <laughs> and on the strength of that, she went to England. So along came Lee. And uh, <laughs> that's a long story of how we got married. But uh, she was about to fly out to New Zealand, actually. And I uh, thought we was going to lose her forever. But uh, God intervened again in an amazing way. Long story. Amen. But, you know, I don't know of anybody who would have been who would have stuck with the level of warfare that we have experienced, that I've experienced and she's experienced with me. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who would have been as loyal and stuck with me as Lee has. There's no one else who would have been such a, a sacrificial and, and laying down for the kingdom and surrender to God. So we've had an amazing journey. So just a couple of things, prophetic words over you as a church. Uh, where's my Bible gone? There it is. I've got Psalm 28 for you. Do with another thing, couldn't I? <laughs> Psalm 28 says this. <clears throat> it's the latter part of Psalm 28. It's talking about David crying out to God. I got this when your pastor was crying out for, uh, he was praying that prayer of the blind man, crying out to God, yeah? This is the context I got it. I couldn't believe it. He's, he's praying this prayer, and I'm getting this prophetic word at the same time about crying out to God. He says, don't be silent in the first few verses there. But in verse 6, he says, blessed be Yahweh. It says Lord in, in most versions, but it's actually Yahweh in the, in the passage. Blessed be Yahweh, who has heard my cry for mercy. Yahweh is my strength and my shield, and in him my heart trusts. I am, so I am sustained, and my heart leaps for joy. And I praise him with my whole body. The, Yahweh is, my, is the strength to his people, a safe refuge for his anointed king. Save thy people and bless thine own. Shepherd them and carry them over. So what is God trying to say through that? The other word I got was from uh, Isaiah 50, 56 verse 17. It's the house of prayer. And it says that he will have joy in his house of prayer. The only way you can have joy in the house of prayer is if you get answered prayer. Yes? 
God wants to answer your prayers. He's heard your cry. Not only has he heard your cry, but he will answer it. You know, for a whole year, I was, I was in pain and agony with a, a back, which I, I sort of traumatized in Africa, in Ethiopia. And I was miserable for a whole year. And I was sat on the throne. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about sat on the throne. <laughs> Most people say you shouldn't pray in those places, but I do. I'll pray anywhere. And I'm, I'm just talking to God. And it's after a year of absolute pain and agony. It was like an electric bolt in my back, just paralyzing me. And I just meditating on how, you know, you, you cry out to Abba Father in Romans 14. Romans, sorry, 8 verse 14. It talks about crying out to Abba Father. I said, I cry out to you, my Abba Father. You're my Abba Father. I cry out to you. And then I, I just felt this prophetic word come into my spirit. A rhema of God, a living word said this. And he not only hears my cry, but he answers my cry. Amen. I never felt a thing. Never felt any power. No electric, you know, light. <laughs> things going on, nothing. I got up the next morning, usually I'd get up and I'd get up with a cane and I'd hobble around and I'd just about get to the toilet without getting, you know, without being in pain. I was just in pain. From that day onwards, no pain, nothing. I was healed, absolutely healed in my back. It's amazing. He hears your cry, not only, not only do you, does he, you know, not only does he hear your cry, but he answers your cry. So God is saying to you as a church, he wants to answer your cry. Why? Because you're a church who knows how to lift a banner. This is what he's saying to you. What is a banner? A banner is basically a flag of identity. It's, uh, it's to do with God's names. It's your identity is in his names. Yeah. And the first mention of the banner is Yahweh Nissi, isn't it? Yes. The Lord is your banner. What's that about? It's about God rallying to you with angelic assignments. Because you have stood and proclaimed his name for a long time now, that he's going to rally to you with angelic assignments. What he wants you to do is to get some more. He wants to give you wisdom for strategies on the ground. Mm -hmm. You've got the strategies in the air for sure. But I'm not saying you haven't got any strategy on the ground. But he wants to enlighten you, give you the spirit of wisdom and enlightenment to do strategies on the ground. Okay, that's to use a church. <clears throat> for your pastor over here and his wife. Bro. You know, war, uh, war for, uh, prophecy, you have to wage warfare with prophecy. It's, it's a revelation about the will of God, but the will of God has to be fought for. You understand that? Yeah. Satan resists the will of God, but he's not going to be able to resist this one. Okay, so the prophecy over you, bro, is this. For a long time now, you've been like a, a womb of prayer. Mm -hmm. It's like you've been in the womb, in terms of prayer and intercessory warfare. It's been a long journey for you inside that womb. And, uh, and, and he's spoken to me. He's not had many openings in this nation. But what I saw, that you're in the birth canal at this point, bro. There's an enlarging coming. Mm. And that you're going to break through. Yeah. And in your breakthroughs, you're a prophet to the nations. You, you are a prophet to this nation. You are a prophet to the nations. You know that, don't you? Mm. Yep. Okay, he knows that. <laughs> and that God's saying that, you know, it says, cursed is he. Uh, the Lord says, you cursed is he who removes his neighbor's pegs. And this is not to do with you because the enemy hasn't, he's, he's, he's sort of put you in a, a narrow place. But it's like you're in that birth canal about to be birthed into something new. A breakthrough into this nation and a breakthrough into the nations. But you need others to stand with you, yeah. to push with you, yeah. to push back the enemy. Not to do with, it's more to do with this nation. It's pushing back the enemy to do with the boundary pegs. Mm. Satan has moved the boundary pegs of this nation. Mm. It says, cursed is he who removes your boundary pegs yeah. or your boundary stones is what the Jews had, right? But we don't understand stones. We understand mm. pegs, don't we? Mm. Okay? <laughs> You need to push. You need to invite God to push. So your pastor knows how to do that, but God is really saying, hey, man, uh, you know, and I'm willing to get with you on this one. Lord, I want to proclaim over this man of God, Lord God, a breakthrough, that you are Yahweh of the breakthrough, that yes, you Lord will God. push with him to push back the enemy to the boundary pegs of his inheritance, not for his sake, but for the sake of this nation, Lord God, to launch this nation into a kingdom breakthrough, to understand intercessory warfare prayer like they've never understood it, to see a breakthrough in this nation. I proclaim that, Lord, that time is coming and soon. Lord, we say, Lord, bring it to pass. Bring it to pass in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, <clears throat> okay. When did COVID start? Was it was it the year twenty twenty? Was it twenty twenty? Okay. Man, no, I'm sorry, I'm getting in the way of that. Twenty nineteen, right at the very end. In China. Twenty nineteen, right. So it's about twenty. It was the it was January twenty twenty. I was having a, I was declaring my trouble to God. You know, it's okay to declare your trouble. Yeah. 
Israel murmured, but that's different. They were slandering God's character when they murmured. Yeah. They were saying, you brought us into the wilderness to kill us. Mm. They had abandonment trauma. Mm. They never came into sonship. So mm. it's okay. You're meant to. It's healthy to declare your trouble to God. David did this all the time. So I'm declaring my trouble, right? I'm saying, hey, God, you know, what I've got, I feel like what I've got, the church needs, but it doesn't want. Mm. I don't know if you felt like that, Glenn. Yeah. You felt like that sometimes? And I, I, I was getting this, I've been sat on some amazing paradigm shifting revelations to look at look at life and the kingdom through different lenses and uh, I said oh, I'm really discouraged Lord do you know what he, he gave me two songs two songs he says he'll sing over you with songs of deliverance do you know yes. that Psalm, yeah. Psalm 32 yeah. verse 7 I think it is and I got this first song and I don't go around singing this song all the time it was the times they are a changing Bob Dylan. Do you remember Bob Dylan? Anybody remember yeah. Bob Dylan? No, you don't remember Bob Dylan? Okay. That goes back to about 1960, that song. Do you remember Bob Dylan, bro? <laughs> he wasn't even born then. He wasn't even born then. He remembers Bob Dylan. Okay, that's a song about the times that are changing. The 60s is when the times did change, yeah. by the way. Yes, yes. It became, that's, that's when the rebellion started. Yeah. And the down, the downfall, mm -hmm. that's when witchcraft started to come in through rebellion anyway. Mm -hmm. So that was the first song. Now, I didn't know COVID was coming then, right? So God's saying, hey, it's going to change, Alan. They're going to want what you've got. Mm -hmm. And the second song was, was, a, was actually a melody. It wasn't, I didn't, I didn't have the words. I didn't even know what it was. I thought it may be some national anthem. And it goes like this. It goes, da 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 you know, melody wasn't the, it didn't stop the melody. It's written by a, a hymn and it goes, Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, God of might. So what was God saying to me? Get joyful, Alan! <laughs> Get joyful because it's gonna, they are gonna need what you want. Yeah. And this is a manifestation of that. I've been hidden in God's quiver for a very long time, mm. ever since I had a brain tumor in 1990. This first discovered in 1999, 98, sorry, 98, October 1998. I've been through, we've been through, Lee and I have been through a lot, a journey, a massive journey of suffering. Wherever there's suffering, there's glory. Mm -hmm. yes. now, I tell you, we have a glory in our spirit, so we mm -hmm. carry a glory. Anyway, those are two songs. <coughs> and then I get, I get a strange word. I felt the Lord say to me prophetically, I want to come with a surge of my power. I'm thinking, what does that mean, God? What's that look like? You know, how, how do we get that surge of power? So I felt him say, go and ask an electrician. So I asked this electrician, what's the surge of power? How do you get a surge of power? He says, it's a lightning strike. You get a lightning strike. So I still wasn't any wiser as to how we're going to do this, right? And I keep meditating on Psalm 45, uh, verse 4 and 5. It talks about how, how Yahweh rides through the heavens. Do you know that God rides through the heavens on angels to break through into our realm? With assignments, right, from heaven. And it says he writes for truth, humility, and justice. That's his core values of the kingdom. And then it says he comes with a sword. I know what the sword's about. I knew that. And then he comes with awesome deeds of his right hand blessing. I knew what that was about. And then it says arrows. I'm thinking, I've got a clue what that is, Lord. What are these arrows? You know, it took me a, it took me a massive journey for that one. I finally came against Psalm 18 in my meditations. And it talks about it in verse 14 and 15. It talks about these arrows of lightning. And it talks about God coming with a rebuke against the enemy. And about an Exodus-type experience for David. And Exodus-type experience is God making a way where there's no way. He made a way for David. He broke a militant witchcraft assignment. And I knew that I could see in the world climate to do with America, especially to do with America, that the spirit of militant witchcraft was rising up like we've never seen. Ever since we've had that law passed to redefine marriage, there has yeah. been a, a militant witchcraft spirit that's risen up, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes? yes. Okay. And Antichrist comes with it. Yeah. You can't, you know, you have to have militant witchcraft spirit first. Jezebel comes first. She rides on these seven beastly kingdoms. There's an eighth kingdom coming, 
And we are seeing the emergence of it now, I believe. Mm. And it's cultural Marxism, mm. which your pastor yes. informed you about. You know mm. about cultural Marxism, don't you? Yeah? Yes. Anybody yes. don't know what, what cultural Marxism is? You can talk to me later. You want to know a little bit. <laughs> so, surge of power. I see in this passage something different for the first time in my life. The, the context is David is in an in a unassailable position. He's trapped. Saul is coming around this mountain. It's called the Rock of Escape. Saul doesn't know where David is, but David knows where Saul is. Mm. He sends out these uh, eight pr proclamations or praise proclamations of God's names. Shh, you are my shield. You are my refuge. You are my fortress. You are my strong tower. You are my rock. Uh, there's eight of them. Can't remember them all. <laughs> should memorize them, shouldn't I? Eight names. There's no psalm like it in the Psalms. These were the arrows. Praise. You know, what is praise? We've not defined it. We've not made a difference between praise and worship. Praise is basically praising his names. And behind every name is a different manifestation. Do you understand that? Yeah. When you proclaim El Shaddai, that's the name for blessings above and blessings below. Unfortunately, in most Bibles, they do not even put in El Shaddai. Mm -hmm. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret of the Most High God, right? in the secret place of the Most High God, shall abide in the shadow of Almighty, El Shaddai is there. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you want to know the blessings of God earth, you've got to get in touch with the Most High God who's going to overrule the enemy for your life, mm -hmm. that his plans and schemes will be fulfilled, that he will be the Lord of your history. doesn't matter what the enemy does to you, he is the most high God to overrule. He says concerning the nations in Psalm 33, he says, shout for joy in the beginning of that psalm. So what are you to shout for joy? One of the decrees of God is in there. It says in verse 10 and 11, the plans and the counsels of nations will come to nothing. All what, the, what Biden is doing in America, all this cultural Marxism, it's going to come to nothing in the end, I'll tell you now. Because God has his decree. And his decree is going to reach every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, in the last the latter part, the last three and a half year of history where the church thinks it's gone and is saying that it's going to be raptured, that's the time when God's going to do his best work. Yeah. He's going to pour when Satan is cast out of the heavenlies from that courtroom. If you don't believe in the courtroom, you can talk to me later. He's there blocking up the heavenlies. Why do you think why do you think we have to be so persistent in prayer? Not because God's reluctant. There's a battle. There's a real battle. Yeah. So when that happens, I tell you, man, all, all heaven is going to break loose on the earth. We're going to see, we're going to do, a, God's going to do a quick work, right? But we're going to see an increase. I believe we, as a church, we are involved in actually seeing Satan cast out of the heavenlies because of courtroom prayer. Mm. Wow. That's why God's released wow. courtroom prayer at this time, mm. to actually dislodge him out of the heavenlies. Mm. We are part of that. Right? right? So we are a Davidic generation. Yeah, we are the yeah. greater David. But also, David, you need to study David. If you want to know how to pray, yes, yeah, study the apostolic prayers, as your pastor says, they're key. But also study David. By the way, your worship team, your, your praise team. Guys, you know, the church, some of the church, most of the church is just worshiping God. There's nothing wrong with that, obviously. That's, worship is priority. It's number one. But we need to become worship warriors. Mm. Yes. You yes. as a team, as, as a worship team, and as a praise team, and a warfare team, you don't just run into the arms of God. You run into battle. You, this church runs into battle. Amen. You know, we have feminized the church. Mm. Why is it we don't have That's more true. men in the church? Because <laughs> we've feminized this. We're all running into the arms of God. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. You need to have that. You need to know God's a refuge. David said, he is my refuge and my what? Fortress. Fortress. That's... That's to fight, right? But you've got to have the refuge before you can fight, right? You've got to have the worship first, obviously, to make you strong in Him and the strength of His might. But what's missing in the church is the lion, the face of the lion. It's missing. It's coming back. It's coming back. So, the tale of two kingdoms. Get myself tripped up here. It's on your screen, yes? The tale of two kingdoms. I don't know if you can read all that. It says the tale of the upside down kingdom, the war with the counterfeit kingdom. What time do we start, by the way, so I don't get carried away? Anybody put me on the clock? What time do we start? Yeah, you can go, go through to 12 15. 12 15. Okay. Still at the clock now. Yeah. Yeah, 12 15 is fine. Okay. 
So there's a war with the counterfeit kingdom. A lot of people don't realize. You know when people say to me, oh, you know, that hate God and that he's responsible for all the suffering and he's evil and all that. Yeah, I agree with them. I say, you're absolutely right. I, I, I hate that God too. But do you know what he's called? He's called the God of this age. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's not the God that I serve. Right. It's actually a God who was once called Lucifer. Yeah. But you know, he doesn't have any names now in the New Testament. Have you ever known that? Yeah. I call him the no-name God. He only has titles. Mm. Yeah? One of his titles is Satan. Mm. Satan means accuser or prosecuting lawyer, mm. uh, adversary. So let me ask you a question. It's used 34 times in the New Testament in 12 different books. So why would that title be prominent in the New Testament if he's not actually in the courtroom of the third heaven and actually prosecuting yeah, yeah. and blocking up things in the heavenlies? That's where the warfare is. And if we, because we've not realized that, then there's a whole element. You know, we, you win battles on this earth in a courtroom. Most battles are won in the courtroom, aren't they? It's the same in the heavenlies. We need to know how to do. We need to know how to do that. Okay. So what's what on earth are the keys? Keys of the kingdom. Well, first of all, this is an upside down kingdom, isn't it? It's right side up. It's really right side up. Everything you can see in the world is a demonic system. It's yeah. got good and evil in it. In the medical world, there's good in the medical world. Yeah. There's also evil in the medical world. There's good in psychology, and there's also evil in psychology. <laughs> Lots of evil in psychology is that they're claiming to heal you and redeem you when they can't. Right. They manage people. Right. Yeah, there's good in it. There's good observations. There's, they've got some revelations. But they leave out the centrality of the gospel. They leave out the human spirit. They don't have anything about the human spirit. Yeah. They haven't got a clue. That's where change takes place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take place in your soul. You know it says be renewed in, in, in your mind? Mm -hmm. People think psychology. They think, oh, if I change my thinking, I'll change. No way you won't. The only thing that's going to change you is revelation. When Paul's yeah, talking about changing your thinking, he's talking about know this, know this, know this. Mm -hmm. That is inner knowing. That's in your spirit. Mm -hmm. That's revelation. That's illumination. That's the only thing that's going to change you. Not just by you trying in a psychological way to change your thinking. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. A lot of Christians have not understood that. Mm -hmm. So this is a different kingdom. It doesn't lord it over you. Yeah, mm -hmm. He's a servant king. Yeah. You know, if I'd been God and come down to earth, I think my ego would have got the better of me if I, if I was God with, with the ego Alan Beadle's God. You know what I mean? I have to keep my ego in check. I don't know about you. you know? I mean, I, I would have been tempted to say, hey, don't you know who I am? I'm God in human flesh. You can't talk to me like that. <laughs> you know? And you need to surrender to me. You need to bow down and worship me. You know what? He doesn't say anything about that to anyone. Yeah. He, he lets them, he waits until they realize who he is. Mm. Yeah. And then he receives their worship, but he never tells them who he is, does he? No. The only person he ever told who he was was the woman at the well mm. who uh, had a relational addiction, not a sexual addiction. She had a relational addiction. She wanted a relationship. She, yeah. her, her problem was spiritual. Mm. Christ could see that. Yeah. Mm. And that's why he revealed himself as Messiah to her. Great story. So, what, who shrunk the keys? Matthew 16, 18 to 19. You know, it says to Peter, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And he says that uh, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, etc., etc. You all know this verse, right? I tell you, there's no one who's been into more binding and loosening than me mm -hmm. in my history. Mm -hmm. Benny Tan still says of me, and I, this is in Kai Tai, I was a pastor in Kai Tai with Benny Tan. Anybody know Benny Tan, history maker? No? Okay. He was a pastor in Kai Tai, he's moved to the Cox now. History makes the church I belong to. And uh, he, he would often joke that we're still paying the damage for Alan Beardorff for all the breaking and binding and loosening he did in Kaitaia, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what? In those days, I used to believe you could bind principalities and powers. You can't bind principalities and powers. They are an army. Mm -hmm. You need an army against an army. The only way you're going to deal with principalities and powers is by calling upon mm -hmm. the Lord of Angel Armies, Yahweh of Angel Armies, to actually raise his army mm -hmm. and to take a strike yeah. against these principalities, yes? Mm -hmm. And you never do that alone. You always do it under apostolic prophetic ministry as well, mm -hmm. yeah? You need to be equipped for that. You need mature sonship. We, mm -hmm. we have not... You know, the book of Ephesians is a book to equip church, churches in apostolic mm -hmm. uh, maturity. Apostolic church. That's an apostolic church. If you want to know what it looks like, study Ephesians. You know, the first three chapters is about nothing but identity, 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 yeah? yeah? There's no exhortation to change. 
until chapter 4. And he says, right, because of this high calling, maintain. Live up to that high calling. And, and it says, maintain the unity of the Spirit. We have unity of the Spirit. We need to maintain it, yes? Because yes. the Holy Spirit lives in you. He lives in me. We have unity of Spirit. So why haven't we trained the church in identity in Christ? We should, should spend more time on that. If you want an apostolic church, you've got to get your identity in Christ. Not your identity in Jesus. Notice in that passage, it says you've been, you've been given every blessing by the Father in the heavenly places in your identity in who? Read it. In Christ, not in Jesus. What's the difference? Jesus, it means Yahweh is my salvation. That's what you re receive from Christ. You receive salvation and redemption, yeah? yeah? That's what he does. And it's what he is as well. But Christ is to do with his kingly it means anointed king. In other words, if you get your identity in the anointed king, then guess what? You start to become a king. You don't want to be princess warriors, girls. Forget about being princess warriors. That's flipping queen of heaven. That's witchcraft, right? Yeah, amen. You want to be kings, yeah. right? Yeah. In Christ, I'm not talking about gender neutrality, by the way, but in terms of status, there's no, there's no, there's, there's no status in Christ. It's you know, between men and women. Right? There's, there's an equal status between men and women. So there's often non-gender words used like king. The other one, non-gender one, is sons. You're all sons of God. Do you realize how, how that is so radical? Mm -hmm. This is 2,000 years ago, and Christianity is saying that all women are raised to sonship and inheritance. I mean, Amen. come on, man. Amen. This kingdom gospel is more radical yeah. than anything. Mm -hmm. And it was preached 2,000 years ago. Way ahead of any feminist movement. <laughs> so, who shrank the keys? We shrank the keys to binding and loosing. I'm not against binding and loosing demons, but you can't bind and loose principalities and powers, right? You understand that? You can bind demons, for sure. And you can loose things. But uh, let's go on to the next slide. So, what is the gospel of the kingdom? Uh, well, they're revealed in the good news of the kingdom. I would say most Christians do not understand the kingdom gospel. We have not really preached the kingdom gospel. I only got a hold of this through the Old Testament, actually. I didn't get a hold of it from the New. I got, when I had a brain tumor, I had this, either, either, I, either something went wrong in my brain, or I got a revelation from God. You can choose. <laughs> but I, I got a revelation of the four faces of God. I realized the face of the lion is the kingdom. And this is embedded in Israel's identity, by the way. Yeah. It's, it's embedded in their prophetic mandates. Judah was the, the you know, Messiah was going to come down the line. It's the ruling tribe, breakthrough tribe. Yeah? We're of the tribe of Judah, you, you know that. Well, that's what you call yourself, don't you? The roar of the lion, right? So it's the kingdom. It's about the kingdom. The man is about the incarnation. It's down the bottom, the tribe of Reuben it was. On the left, Ephraim. It was the ox. Did you know the prophetic mandate on Ephraim was to push back its enemies like a wild ox? Mm. That's what we're meant to do. Mm. To push back the enemy like a wild ox. We are little mini redeemers, yeah? Mm. So the king of redemption was the ox, wasn't it? Mm. It, it foreshadows. These all foreshadow the, the keys of the kingdom. Mm. So it's the key of the cross, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, it's foreshadowing it. It's the nature of God as the redeemer. You've got to have the nature before you have the cross, don't you? Mm. You've got to have a redeemer who's passionate... He's passionate about you. Do you know he passionately yes. loves you? Yes. Yes. Not just a little bit. You, to go to the cross, man, you've got to be passionate. Yes. You know? I think, I, think I, I think twice about going to the cross for you. Yeah. Or maybe you. Not the world. All the ungodly world as well. He went to the cross for the ungodly world. Yeah. All these stuff people are coming out with saying that God's love is no longer unconditional. That's rubbish. Mm. God's entry into the kingdom is conditional. But his love is unconditional. He died on that cross. For ungodly people, mm. he the, the potential is for the right of redemption of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Then the face of the eagle at the top. Well, doesn't that tell you the eagle? Come on, the Most High God. You know that's the resurrection, the ascension. It gets you on the throne, doesn't it? Mm. That's how I learned these these keys of the kingdom. So what is the key of the kingdom? It goes like this: the kingdom comes through Christ, the servant king, who preaches an upside down kingdom. He becomes God incarnate as a man and lives a sinless life, the incarnation. He died on a cross 
a cruel cross to take back the right of redemption of the earth. Let me say he did not displace Satan's position as the God of this age. And he didn't displace him out of the heavenlies either. Mm. But in terms of the right of redemption of the earth, do you know what? He could have taken that right then. He could have come back then if he wanted. Do you, know, you realize that? But he doesn't break that scroll of the right of redemption until the book of Revelation. Mm. When he does that, look out, man. The kingdom's coming in great power and might when he does that, right? Mm. He's claiming back the earth. So this right of redemption gets back your identity as sons of God. Also, we'll get back creation ultimately. So, that's what he got back. He goes to Hades, the place of the dead. Takes back the keys of death and Hades. Notice it's not hell. We'll come back to that. It's not hell. It's Hades. The place of the dead. To deliver us from the second death. You have immortality. Do you realize that? You are never get, you're going to die physically, but you are never going to die. Yeah. When you die, you're going you're to get a whole no bunch of angels. Before, you're going to see the four faces of God. You're going to see this chariot of cherubim. God's going to carry you on a chariot of cherubim back to heaven yeah. as soon as you die. Yeah. It'll probably give you a few moments to look around and you know, realize that you're dead. Maybe you die in <laughs> sleep and you wake up and you go, oh, and you see all these angels all around you. I mean, you're going to be absolutely awestruck at heaven. You won't want to come back to earth again, I'll tell you. So, he rises from the dead and ascends to the highest throne in the heavens, the resurrection and the ascension. Why? To lift you up. <laughs> so you can sit with him. Are you sat in the gap? What's the gap? We all fall short of the glory of God. Do you fall short of the glory yeah. of God? Yeah. You know, when you become a Christian, you didn't realize you were a sinner before, did you? I didn't. Yeah. Did you think you were a sinner before? No. Didn't really think about sin as a non-Christian, you know? What's sin? Become a Christian, all of a sudden your conscience is awakened. And then you realize how, fall, how far you fall short, right? But then you can come under the law. God doesn't want you under the law. He wants you the law of love. You know what the law of love is? It's different from Moses' covenant. Yeah. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God is not us. He says, love one another as I have loved you. What's his love like? It's lavish. It's constantly poured out it's an embracing love it's a blessing love when you come into the presence of god he's not coming with a critical condemning finger there is no condemnation in christ there are no stones in god's hands right everyone who comes into the presence of christ must drop their stones including you if you're judging yourself you need to stop it right now because it's going to stop you from sitting on the throne god's greater than your heart he says if your heart condemns you or accuses you god is greater what does that mean doesn't condemn you. Mm -hmm. There is no condemnation. Does God bring you conviction? Of course yes. He does. But it's it's with him. It's when He embraces you. Mm. It's when you're in, you're in His arms and, and being held in His arms that He will speak to you. Mm -hmm. And it won't. It will be such a a hopeful conviction that will mm. give you a way out and give you hope that hey, I can overcome this. Not a condemning, you know, shaming thing. You need to get rid of shame. It's mm -hmm. not from God. Deal with that later. <laughs> Okay, this is a simplified version, okay, in case you looked at that one and think, oh, I don't really understand that. Well, I hope it's a simplified. But you can simplify this again if you want. If you want to remember what the gospel is. So the kingdom comes by the man Christ who lives a sinless life, dies on the cross to redeem us and the earth, and takes the keys of death and Hades to deliver us from the second death, and is raised from the dead and ascends to the highest throne. Okay. There's a mistranslation in the, new, in the King James. There's a couple of mistranslations. Now, I'm not against the King James, except uh, it's, it's a very poetic version, uh, apart from the these and the thous, which, you know, very hard to... We don't talk like that. That's Old English, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We don't talk like that today. So, in, this, in the King James Version, it says that he... <coughs> concerning the keys, it talks about the, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Now, it's the gates of Hades. It's not hell. Mm -hmm. How many of you know that Satan hasn't got any government in hell? He has got no government. The gates are about government. He has no government in hell, right? Mm -hmm. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. No way. He's, got, he's in there to be punished, mm -hmm. not to have any government, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. where does he have his gates? Well, he doesn't have his gates in Hades either anymore. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Christ went in there and he took the keys of the second death, the gates of, of Hades. He took it away from him. Yeah. And when he was in there, he made a proclamation to Noah's generation. Do you know what Noah's generation was about? 
the sons of God, the rebel gods, left their first estate, yeah. their, their boundaries, mm -hmm. and they had sex with women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So literally there was half angels and half men. That's where all the giants came from. Mm -hmm. That's where all the Nephilim came from. Mm -hmm. The Nephilim came through Ham, and Ham produced the Canaanites. Mm -hmm. They were so evil that God said, I have to destroy every one of you, including the women and the children and all the animals. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they had the seed of Nephilim in them. Wow. God could not afford that seed to get into the earth. It would have destroyed the earth. That's why he destroyed all the people, by the way. Mm -hmm. God's not into destroying people. Mm -hmm. But when it says the imagination, after these had sex, you know, the rebel gods had sex, left, left heaven. After they had sex, it says the imagination of man's heart was evil continually. Mm -hmm. When that happens, there's no room for redemption, is there? Mm -hmm. So he went in there and says, you know, I used to think that he preached to people and gave them a second chance. So I used to preach like that. I've had a lot of heresies. I've had to unwind. I'm glad I'm 74 now. And I'm writing my books and I've unwound a lot of my rubbish that I had. But I now know that what that was about. In the Greek, it's proclamation. It's not preaching. It's a proclamation. He got in their face and said, See, you tried to pollute the seed. He was trying to pollute the seed of Messiah because he knew Genesis 3.15, the declaration of war, that what? He would what? He would bite the, your heel mm -hmm. and you sure. would crush his head. Mm -hmm. They knew that prophecy. They knew about the seed of Messiah coming. And those rebel gods were trying to block it and poison the seed, weren't they? Mm -hmm. That's why God had to destroy the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that? That's not a mean, nasty God. Mm -hmm. That is a gracious God who's concerned about the redemption of the planet. Mm -hmm. That's what everything God does is out of love. Mm -hmm. Do you understand yeah. that? Even his judgment yes. there. Mm -hmm. So he got in their face and said, See, I'm here. I'm, I'm the Messiah. I got you. <laughs> you, tried to, you tried to sabotage and derail me, but I got you. Mm. It's a real proclamation of victory, wasn't it? Mm. So, yeah, we, you know, we're meant to get excited about the, the, you know, we're dealing from the second death and this triumph of God, yeah? Mm. yeah? But is that warfare? Well, I guess it can be if you proclaim the triumph of the cross over the enemy, yeah. Mm. But you know what? Do you know where his throne really is? Psalm 94, verse 20 is where his throne is. So his throne is not in Hades. Do you understand that? We're not, we're not doing warfare against Hades. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Why would you do warfare against Hades? The warfare has ended there. <laughs> he's, he's delivered us from death, from the second death. Why would you warfare concerning Hades? There's no warfare there. Yeah, there's a celebration there. You're not in agreement with that. Anybody not in agreement with that? I think he's still the warfare's in Hades. Have a, have, a, have a think about it. So this is where the warfare is. Psalm 94, verse 20. This is an interesting scripture. Came across this one recent times when I started studying more deeply on iniquity. It says, Shall the throne of iniquity, which devises evil by law, have fellowship with you? Devises evil by law. What is Biden and a lot of people doing, and even this country is doing today? We are changing the laws. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had a Judeo-Christian foundation, haven't we? Mm -hmm. In our core values. Yeah. Yeah. Ever since we redefined marriage. You know, some people say that Christ never spoke against homosexuality. Do you know where he spoke against homosexuality? He did. Mm -hmm. Genesis. Yeah. He referred to Genesis. He said that marriage is between a man yeah. and a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Complementary. There's nothing complementary between a man and a man. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you now. There's nothing that you can impart to one another. You actually demasculate men mm. when it's just men and men, and, and, and you, the same with women. There's nothing that's complementary, and you destroy the image of God. Mm. He spoke about it right there. We have what God has defined, man has no right to, to redefine. Mm. Ever since we did that, I want to tell you that the sexual confusion that's come in through cultural Marxism, one of its aims yeah. is to get rid of all sexual repression. Mm. This has brought a flood tide, right? And we'll come back to that in Isaiah 59, what God wants to do in verse 16 to 19 to do with this flood tide of iniquity. It says the throne of iniquity. It should be translated in the Septuagint, it's translated as throne of lawlessness. My brother, who's a textual expert, I'm sure if I've got any, any wrong things, he'll come and tell me later. And we'll have a good discussion. But it should be the throne of lawlessness. It says the throne of destruction in some version. But lawlessness is iniquity, isn't it? And it talks about devising, you know, changing the laws. And he says, they gather together against two, us, the righteous, and condemn innocent blood. The Lord has, Yahweh has been my defense, and, and, and Elohim, my rock of refuge. 
He has brought on them their own iniquity. This is what we need to pray concerning the leaders of this, not mm -hmm. the average person. Yeah? And shall cut them off in their own wickedness. So iniquity is wickedness. What is iniquity? Okay, I'll go over here. Iniquity. NIV does not translate iniquity. This is the greatest error, I think, that we have in Christianity, is that people are not teaching about iniquity. And it's like this. Okay. <clears throat> iniquity means to be bent. Mm -hmm. You're bent out of shape. Right? It means any distortion of truth, any deviation from truth is iniquity. It's a stronghold. Anything which becomes a stronghold in your life that you just, you know, you can't get, you can't get rid of. I'll explain strongholds in my life in a minute. So, sin, iniquity. Sin, transgression, iniquity is what was put on the scapegoat. Can I just put my hand on your head, bro? So you're a scapegoat. High priest would put his hand on the scapegoat. One goat he would kill. This is to do with iniquity. Mm -hmm. The other goat he would place the sin, the transgression, the iniquity. Different. All different. On the goats. So that poor goat was then sent into the wilderness and abandoned. And that's what happened to Christ on the cross, wasn't it? Mm. Suffered abandonment, trauma. And you will suffer. Iniquity will cause you to suffer abandonment, trauma. That's the number one thing that I counsel. I'm a professional counselor. Mm -hmm. That's the number one thing that I deal with is abandonment, trauma. In people's lives, and we've missed it as a church. Rejection is not the strong man. Abandonment trauma is the strong man. Rejection is a power, but it's not principality. Spirit of death is the principality, but its main thing is abandonment trauma that it uses. Yes? Abandonment trauma is when you're you're on your own. You just feel totally alone. No glue, no glue of love from childhood often. Mm -hmm. Toxic parenting. So Hamartia in the Greek in the New Testament means to shoot an arrow, sin, shoot an arrow at a target and you fall short. So everyone falls short of the glory of God, the character of God, and the purpose of God, right? Falling short. It says in Isaiah 50, 59 verse 1, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Sin will not separate you from God. If sin separates you from God, then you're finished. Yeah? It's iniquity causes that separation, Right? And then it goes on, transgression. Transgression is to step across a boundary. Mm -hmm. So if I shoot an arrow into your foot, I'm using the illustrations of an arrow, right? An arrow into your foot. And you, you go, hey, man, that really hurt. Don't do that. And you say, don't do that again. And I go, I shoot an arrow into your foot again. Mm -hmm. I've already stepped across a boundary, but mm -hmm. when you say no, and I don't respect your no, iniquity. then, well, it it's can start to turn into iniquity. But it's transgression at that point. Mm -hmm. If I keep practicing it, it becomes iniquity. Practice mm. is what causes iniquity. So mm. Doing it more than once or twice, yeah. yeah? If I keep doing it, keep doing it, it becomes iniquity. Mm. Iniquity means a bent arrow that's bent out of shape, even from childhood. Some people are bent out of shape from childhood. They're shot in the wrong direction. Mm. They're sexually abused from childhood. They're shot in the wrong direction. So it basically means that... <clears throat> The way that you see life is twisted, yeah. even about yeah. yourself. You just don't see yourself as God sees you. It's a twisted perception. So in my life, did I have iniquity in my life? Of course I did. Do you have iniquity in your life? Probably. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're separated from God because you're in Christ, right? But iniquity not dealt with, like, if it's cross broadband across your life, then obviously it's a... You know, for the unbeliever, that's what separates them. So all Christians do suffer from iniquity. In, Rome, in uh, Acts 8, it talks about Simon the sorcerer, who was a disciple, mm -hmm. water baptized. And Peter rebukes him because he's wanting to pay money to see the power of God, right? Mm -hmm. Peter rebukes him and says, hey, your money perish with you. And he says, you are, you are bound in the poison of bitterness. Mm -hmm. You are bound in iniquity. Right? So it's possible. Is it possible to have Christians have iniquity? Yes. Yeah. Strongholds? Yes. Okay. Good. Glad we're agreed on that one. <laughs> so, what was my iniquity? I've had a few areas to overthrow, obviously, right? I mean, <clears throat> at uh, age 13, my dad comes down and tells me that he's going to leave my mum. They hadn't had sex for five years. They didn't even know what sex was. I'm a 13 year old in a, in a generation of the 60s, not now, right? Yeah. They never clue what sex was. I don't know. Sex, what's that? I was pretty false. Yuck. What's that? They haven't sex, what's that? <laughs> so I blame my mother, of course, you know, for the whole thing. She tried to commit suicide. He said, You need to decide who you're gonna live with. 
If you live with me, you have nothing to do with your mum. If you live with your mum, you have nothing to do with me. Oh. Root bitterness. That is iniquity. Yeah. Bitter root judgments. Yeah? You can have bitter root judgment against yourself, by the way. The stony heart is when you have bitter root judgments, yeah. either against other people or yourself. Mm. It can work both ways. You become walled in in bitterness. Mm. God wants to take out the heart of stone. Mm. Yeah. How can you tell? Because you don't really have this affectionate relationship with God. God is affectionate. Mm. Why do you think he gave you arms? I know not everybody's got arms. My, my sister-in-law hasn't. She's fluid mind. She hasn't got arms properly. Arms for that ear, right? But most of us in here have got arms, haven't we? Mm -hmm. So why have you got arms? We, we hug like this, man, don't we? Go like that. You know, when, you, when you're hugging the women, you feel them a bit. That's just a tip for the men, by the way. Not too much of that. Though. Just a little bit. Don't get too affectionate. So God's this affection of God. Yeah? Have you got that he's affectionate? Remember Christ when he came to Mary Magdalene? A lot of people they think that in that resurrection morning that he was trying to get Mary Magdalene off him because he said, don't hug me, didn't he? Mm. No, he wasn't. She was hugging him to bits mm. and, he, and he was letting her hug him and he's saying, you can't keep holding me, I have to go. Mm. That's what he was saying. Okay, He wasn't saying, don't hug me. Mm. He was, she was used to hugging him. Yeah, she mm. had to be. So in my life, I had this abandonment trauma. I had a few things going, but one of the things I had is down my line, there's iniquity down my line. So what is it? It's blood guilt. My grandfather committed suicide. He went into a slurry pit. Do you know what a slurry pit is? Mm. It's like coal dust. It's liquid coal dust. Liquid coal. Black stuff. Just went into it and killed himself. He cursed his identity by doing that. He cursed himself as being worthless. That's what I was struggling with. I felt worthless. I felt not good enough. Mm. Sometimes I felt not good enough. Sometimes I felt worthless. It's called shame. Mm. And sometimes it's toxic. And I experienced it like that. Mm. I had this voice inside my head, which is in my conscience, which was continually accusing me and saying that I was a failure. Every time I'd fail, I didn't just like fail. I actually felt a failure in my identity. Yeah? Mm. I struggled against that. I was struggling against an ancestral spirit of blood guilt. I want to tell you, there are, there are certain iniquities which has the death penalty. Not in the New Testament, but in the Old. But the spirit of death is attached to these types of iniquities. Mm. I know this from counseling people at the cold face for the last 20 years or more as a professional, right? So I know what I'm talking about. It's this, this iniquity factor and shame and abandonment that comes into people's spirits. <clears throat> so I had this identity issue. How did I get rid of it? I confessed the iniquity. Mm. And I broke the curse. The curse needs to be broken as well. There's a curse, a failure. I, I was self-imposed curse. I was agreeing with it. Mm. I didn't know it was there, but I had agreement with it. You have to break the agreement with this thing, right? Because I'd unzipped. I'd unzipped the iniquity, basically. You, sometimes you don't unzip every iniquity that's down your line. Mm. It's like software. It's in there, but you have to download it. So I agreed with this thing that I was a failure. And it dogged me for a long time. I nearly committed, I didn't commit suicide. I had a stress breakdown. And why one? I needed one to have a holiday. <laughs> but I had a stress breakdown when I was about 38. Anybody ever had a stress breakdown? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you know what that's like, it's like a black brain. You look at the wall and you have obsessive compulsive thinking. You know, I'm glad that I had a stress breakdown. Do you know why? Because I can counsel people with depression now. Yeah. I hadn't got a clue about depression before then. My brain chemistry had changed. Mm. Brain chemistry is your serotonin. Your serotonin is your good feel. You know, I feel good. Do, 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 do. You lose that. It's gone, right? Yeah. And you have this black brain. You're, you're obsessive, compulsive. Oh, no optimism, no hope. That's why people kill themselves. Mm. I understand this, right? God redeemed me from this. I saw that thing down my line. Confessed that blood guilt. Blocked the ancestral spirit with the cross. The cross delivers you. The blood cleanses you from iniquity, but the cross delivers you from it. Amen. I got delivered from that curse. I broke that thing over me. And you know what? I got inside my spirit something different. That in the eyes of Christ, I am more than a conqueror. I was very achievement focused. In Wyoming, we are very task focused. Mm -hmm. Oriented. And we were relational too. But, you know, the task. 
And, uh, you know, I just saw that if I'm more than a winner, more than a conqueror, it's because God loves me. It's got nothing to do with achievement there, is it? Mm. Just that God loves you. Not just a little bit. He loves you with a passionate, lavish love that is an ever-flowing stream. And it doesn't stop. It's not based on your performance. Do you understand that? It's not based on your performance. If you're under performance, which I was, you're under the law. It will kill you. And you need to be killed so you can be driven to get a hold of the Redeemer in a different way. I got a hold of God in a different way. It's like if I failed after that, I'm still more than a winner. I'm still more than a conqueror. You can't take, you can't take that away from me. You know what God said to me? I've had a lot of failures in my life. I've had planted churches that have failed, ministries that have failed, people I've led to Christ that have backslid. And one day I was having a moan about it to God, thinking, Lord, all this, you know, all this litter of failure. And do you know what he said to me? Alan, anything you do for me is gold. Mm. You did it for me. Mm. You did it for me, therefore that is gold. When you come into my presence, mm. that, that's not hay, wood or stubble. Mm. You did it for my glory. Yeah. Don't worry about them, what happened wow. to them, or yeah. all that Thank stuff. You, that's it. Yeah. So, Redeemed from iniquity. Isaiah chapter, I believe that's what this church is about, by the way. Isaiah, this is you. Isaiah, this is what the church by and large is not doing in this hour. We've had a flood tide of iniquity, haven't we? Mm. Yeah. It's flood tide. It's flood tide. Yeah. When, it, when sexual confusion gets down to children, this yeah. is flood tide, mm. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Right? This is different. You, you know that, don't you? You know this yeah. is a different age that we're in yeah. now. Yeah. It's totally changed. So what does it say about this? It says, the context of this passage, Isaiah 59, is iniquity. So I know that the flood is about iniquity, right? And Satan's throne is about iniquity, isn't it? Mm, He's yeah. brought in the iniquity of same-sex marriage. It's a perversity. It's, it's bent out of shape, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, all these interviewers, they interview all these Christians, and, and they're so, I don't know, they're all, always on the back foot. I'd love to be interviewed by some of these people. Mm. You, know, I would, you know what I'd say when they say, oh, do you think homosexuality is sin? Do you know what I think I'd say? Have you ever been to a garage? Imagine you go to a garage, and you see a man or a woman take a, the petrol hose, you know, the, what do they call them? The nozzle. Mm -hmm. The petrol nozzle, yeah. out of, you know? And they put it in exhaust pipe. <laughs> and fill it full of petrol. What would you think about that? And you know what? If they wouldn't answer me, then I wouldn't answer the question. Yeah. Because it's obvious that, that the homosexuality is bent out of shape. Now, I'm not against homosexuals, okay? Yeah. I'll tell you my best story. This is radical identification with homosexuals, right? I used to mince to them in, in, um, in uh, Yuan, in, what was it called? Ells Court, with my wife. My wife was mistaken for a prostitute one time, by the way. She didn't know got locked up. <laughs> I was told to move on. <laughs> and anyway, I went into the pubs and uh, talking to homosexuals, right, all the time. And uh, this one guy, he was talking to me in the street. And there was a bus parked. It was a um, squad of soldiers. And they were mocking this guy and laughing at him. They were in a traffic jam. They were doing this for quite a while. So I thought, what, what's going on here? So, I sort of noticed that he had a bit of a burr patch on his jeans. So I looked around and I saw that he had two, he, he cut his jeans out, mm. you know, two holes. Mm. So I said to him, just curious, I said, you know, why, why did you cut your jeans out like that? I do this with counseling all the time, I'm just curious, it's not judgment, mm -hmm. I'm just curious. Yeah. Like, why did you do that? And he said, well, I figure that women go topless, so I'm going to go bottomless, he said. <laughs> What are, you going to, what are you going to say to that? that, is, that that's like, there's no conversation after that, is there? <laughs> so what did I do? I'm, I'm in radical identification with this guy, which is what Christ is about. Yeah. I'm not condemning him. I don't condemn homosexuals. I've right. counseled a lot of them. You know, I'm not in condemnation of them at all. Neither is Christ. No. So I said, can I pray for you? He said, yeah. So I laid hands upon him. You know, I do that in evangelism all the time. Because once I'm praying for somebody... They, sur they surrender to the anointing. Mm. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's going to come. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it will come. Mm. It came upon him. He was touched by that. Mm. He told me the next night that he started to get a revulsion against this. Mm. Holy Spirit come upon him. Mm. I didn't see him again, Jesus. so I don't know what happened to him. Mm. But Christ is radically identified. 
you know, we're in a generation where now they've made it into an identity, so you can't speak against it. Mm -hmm. In the past, you were able to love the person but not agree with the behavior. Yeah. Now, cultural Marxism says you can't do that. Yeah. Identity politics. Mm -hmm. It's uh, stopping us. So anyway, it says in Isaiah chapter 59, context of iniquity, it says, where truth is fallen in the street. This is where we're at now, isn't it? Verse 14, justice is turned back. Wherever there's iniquity, there's a lack of truth, there's injustice. It says in verse 16, he saw there was no man and wondered there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. His own righteousness sustained him. Right? He, put on, he put on the armor of God, basically. He talks about, verse 18, he's going to bring recompense. That means uh, you know, avenging against your enemies. We need to ask God to, to bring vengeance upon the principalities and powers. And verse 19 says that so shall they fear the name of Yahweh from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up standing against him. In the NIV, it says that he comes like a pent-up flood, which the breath of God drives. Mm. Is that pretty accurate or not? Mm. That one? I'll, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a mixture of things in this passage. The standard was... was um, it's, it can be translated as standard, it can be translated as the spirit of Yahweh as well. But if it's a standard, and I believe it is here, then it's God's names, isn't it? Yeah? It's not, it's not raising the standard to do with morality. It's to do with God rising up with a battle standard against it. To, and it says he pushes back the enemy here, right? The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The purpose of the standard was to push back the enemy. The most courageous person would have to have the standard or the flag, wouldn't they? Why was that? If you carry the flag, what's going to happen to you? Well, it's going to go into shot at, aren't you? Yeah. So don't worry that you get, you, get, you get a bit of warfare if you're lifting up the standard. That's only going to make you stronger, by the way. Every attack, you have a right of counterattack against the enemy. So says you come against you one way, he'll flee seven. You have a right to plunder him. Whatever area he's plundered you, you have the right of counterattack from God. You need to raise, ask him to recompense against all that you've lost. You have the right to recompense, yes? Mm -hmm. So in this passage, there's a flood of God's Spirit. God wants, you know, if we don't actually invoke or call upon Yahweh of angel armies to actually cause this flood to arise, which is what you're doing, yeah? Then it's not going to happen, is it? God needs to be called upon to actually rise up. That's why David was always in the psalm saying, Rise up, Lord. Rise up. He will not rise up unless you invoke him to rise up. You understand that as a church, don't you? Yes. That's what you're doing. That's what you're doing here. This church is significant in pushing back the enemy for this generation. It's significant. Do you realize how significant you are? Wow. <clears throat> so God wants to have compassion upon you. According to Micah 7, 18, he says he has compassion upon you and wants to subdue your iniquity. I believe the main iniquity that God wants to deal with this morning is shame. He wants to smash shame. Shame is a blockage to the glory of God. It stops, it stops you experiencing the manifest glory of God. Okay. These are the keys of the kingdom. These are what they unlock. I'm not only going to do one this morning. I'm not even going to do one, I don't think. I think I might just get into it. Opening up. The key of the kingdom unlocks his reign on earth. Yeah? The key of incarnation unlocks access to the throne through, through righteousness. Yeah? The key of his cross unlocks redemption. The key of the resurrection and the ascension unlocks his glory. But what is the revelation that we need to connect and utilize these keys is the question. So we go to the first one. What we need to unlock it is a revelation of authority in Christ's name and to enforce the will of God. So in Matthew 28, verse 18, it's, and I'll pick on the King James again. I hope you're not going to be offended with me if you're a King James only person. It's only, there's only a few things that are wrong with the King James, but this is one of them. It says, and it's, it's because of Calvinism. Do you know what Calvinism is? Yeah. Calvinism believes that God has decreed everything. He's predestined everything. So it doesn't believe in a style of government. God has a government by decree, Yes. <coughs> I mean, otherwise, you know, what's the difference between God being in charge of history and being in control of all history? Is there a difference? In the King James Version, 
it says that he has got all power in the heavenlies. Sorry, all power in heaven on earth. Is that true? If God has got all power in heaven on earth, then God is in control, right? right? But is that biblical? Does he have all power in heaven on earth? Is that a right translation? Well, it's a wrong translation. It says authority. It's the word exousia. There's a difference between the word exousia and the word dunamis. Dunamis means dynamite, mm. dynamic power. The word that they, that's used in this passage is not dunamis, it's exousia. It means legal authority. Mm. So when he's coming back, he's saying, I've given you legal authority. And he says before the cross, he says to the disciples, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. Mm. You see, Calvinism says there's no power battle. There, we've got a worshipping church at the moment who mm. thinks that, that worship is warfare, which is not. Mm. And we do not have a warfare church. Why? Because of Calvinism. The virus of Calvinism is in Pentecostal churches. They don't think there's a power battle. So it's like, well, God's in control. I want you to try an experiment. How about you go to the local marketplace? There's a market, market around here, wherever people go, right? Go to a market. And you interview the non-Christian and say, I just want to tell you that God is in control. Now, what do you think about that? If I was to say God is in control of everything that's going on, what would you say? What would they say? They would say, well, God must be a flipping monster, mm. wouldn't they? Yeah. The place is in chaos. Mm. Satan is bringing chaos at the moment, isn't he? Mm. Yes, Leviathan, his beastly kingdom emerging, all the chaos. He's in charge of human history. How many of you have raised teenagers? Not too many. Same. Were you in charge of your teenagers or in control of them? <laughs> Hands up if you were in control of your teenagers. <laughs> Why? You'd have to power abuse them. You'd, if you are in control, control of your teenagers, you have the power of using them. In the heavenlies, God is called the Lamb of God, and he's got seven horns. Do you know what that speaks of, symbolism, seven horns? If you had seven horns, imagine you came into here with seven horns today, what would it speak of? Do you know? It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Yeah, it's a symbolism. Okay, it's a metaphor. It means he's got perfect power. He's got seven eyes as well. Isn't that crazy? Imagine if you saw somebody with seven eyes and seven horns, it'd freak you out, wouldn't it? He's got all power in the heavenlies. So do you know what we need to do? This is what the Lord showed me. We need to summon the power of God according to Psalm 68, verse 28. Summon the power of God. This is only in the NIV. The NIV's got it right. Okay? Summon the power of God. Do, do, do Christians pray like that? Do, why don't we pray summon the power of God? Because God's in control. He's got power in heaven and earth. No, he hasn't. He's got authority. He can give you a power anointing, for sure. You do need the, the anointing of power as well as mm. authority. But he has authority. So guess what? There's a difference between the decree of God and the will of God. Mm. The decree of God can be hindered, but it can't be stopped. Mm. One of the decrees of God, there's a few in the Bible. I can count quite a few. One of them is that he's going to reach every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Revelation 7, 9, job done. He said, who are these who have come out of the tribulation? They're from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Job done. Mm -hmm. But even after that, there's another harvest. The tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the only feast which hasn't been fulfilled, is all about harvest. Mm -hmm. there is, even after that, there's, I can see two harvests after that. I see a reaping of two harvests, even after the fact that every tribe and every tongue and nation is in. Do you know who's going to be mostly converted during that time when Christ comes back? The Muslims. Mm -hmm. How do I know that? Because it says in the millennium that Israel is first, Assyria is second, and Egypt is third. Mm -hmm. Assyria, Egypt, Muslims. Mm -hmm. Heaps of them are going to surrender when he comes back. Mm -hmm. Or even before. You know, when he comes back, if people bow the knee, do you know they can go into the kingdom? Mm -hmm. They don't bow the knee when he comes back. Then they get right. reversed. <clears throat> okay, I've nearly got time up. Um, just one last thing. In this passage in Isaiah 59 and 16, it's the word porga, and I'm sure your pastor's taught on this. you taught on this one, haven't you? Yeah. I know he has. Paga, a couple of years paga, ago. Paga, paga, porga. I, I think it's porga, but we won't debate that. It doesn't matter. Paga, yeah. porga, whatever. Hebrew. We, we need to invite a Hebrew speaking person. In. Yeah, I looked it up in the. In the yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, it's this word. What does it mean? It means to strike with violence. And with annoying persistence. Mm. Yeah? yeah. I like that. Strike with violence. It's used of in uh, where is it? 1 Kings 246. It says that B 
Benaniah, there's one of Gi giant killers of David, I think, from my memory. Benaniah struck down Shimei, who cursed David, based because Solomon told him to. He commanded him to strike with violence. God commands you to strike with violence. So how do you do that? You actually call upon the Lord of Angel Armies to strike the enemy with violence. That's what you yeah. do. Now, you can strike demons with violence. You can, you can tell them to shut up. I had one demon that was a Freemasonry demon that wouldn't shut up. I realized it was the strongest spirit that I'd ever encountered before, but finally got rid of it after, a, after I found out where it actually invaded. Where, you've got to find out where the enemy breaks in to get him out. But Freemasonry is one of the strongest spiritual powers uh, that I've ever encountered. But we, we, we need to invoke God, to call upon him, to strike the enemy with violence. Yeah? Yeah. That's what we're here for, to see this flood of the Spirit. We need to call upon God to come with a flood, which were you doing today, weren't you? You're prophesying the flood. So God wants to open, we need to open wide the gates for this King of Glory to come on in, this Lord of Angel Armies who's mighty in battle. Oh, I long for the day when the church actually gets a hold and becomes a warrior bride. I know that's the heartbeat of this church. I know it's the heartbeat of your pastor. And I'm sure he's been frustrated. Mm -hmm. But it's, that time is going to come to an end. You, mm -hmm. with, your, with your pastor, you need to proclaim this prophecy he's had today, and I'll proclaim it with him. He, he, the message he has and the message I have needs to get into the body of Christ, doesn't it? Yes. You are a very significant church. So this morning, I want to deal with iniquity. The iniquity I want to deal with, and you may have stuff that's different from this, but wherever you want to deal with, with God, but particularly shame. Shame stops, stops you sitting on the throne. You have to stay where God's put you. He's put you on the throne, yes? yes. I don't come in and out of that throne. That is a sonship. It's a position, position, position. Okay, I won't go any further because he told me 12.15. I've gone over already, so I'm transgressing. Sorry about that, bro. Let's all stand. What do you normally do at this point? Um, like you can close it as you feel the Holy Spirit leading. You can do what you feel. Yeah, I, I, I want to close the meeting. I just want to pray over you corporately. But anybody who wants ministry to do with breaking shame uh, over their lives, you know, you're, you're constantly thinking you're not good enough or you're worthless. That's going to stop you sitting on the throne. That's really important to break. Otherwise, you, you can't get a hold of the key of the kingdom because you don't have royal dignity. It says we are, we are not only justified, but we are glorified in Romans 8.30. Glorified means royal dignity. It means heavenly dignity. It's a royal status. God has given you royal status. Shame will block it. Condemnation will block it. So if you've got a voice in your head that condemns you all the time, or a voice that says you're not good enough or you're worthless, we need to smash that voice today. So I'm just going to pray over you. And if you need ministry, come forward. And the rest, you can be free to do what you need to do. So Lord... I just thank you for, Lord, this beautiful people of God. Thank you for they are beloved of you. Lord, you love them with a lavish love. Lord, wherever that's been blocked, Lord God, wherever the enemy has blocked that, wherever, Lord, people are afraid to deal with the trauma in their lives, Lord God, because they're afraid that if they deal with it, they'll get stuck. I just pray you don't stick them today. Where they've not been glued to you, Lord, where they've not seen that you're glued to them, that you bonded to them. It's not about them bonding to you, but it's about you bonding to them. Open their eyes, Lord God. Give them a spirit of revelation and, and, and wisdom to apply these truths, Father. I pray, Lord God, your anointing, the external anointing of the power of God in this church, and the internal anointing of teaching them. I thank you for this precious body of Christ, Lord God. I pray your cherishing of them. God wants to cherish you, church. You are cherished by the King of Kings. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.